for me to introduce Roger Berkowitz to you today. Uh, uh, Roger got his PhD in jurisprudence and, and social policy at UC Berkeley in the Bolt Hall School of Law. He and I share an intellectual mentor in Philippe Nonet, who taught at Bolt for many years. Um, for five years or more, maybe, maybe longer, we were in a weekly Heidegger reading group, so we had much occasion for productive conversation and argument. Um, in his work, Roger always combines rigorous reading of philosophical texts with careful attention to what those texts mean for us now in this time and place. He's published on a wide array of subjects from political reconciliation to technology and world alienation, what it means to judge and why we must judge, the ups and downs of the relationship between science and law. If anything unites all those themes, I would say it's the way in which Roger always asks us to seek, well, to ask what it truly means for any of us to be just. Roger is the director of the Hannah Arendt Center for Ethical and Political Thinking at Bard College, where he's also an associate professor of political studies and human rights. His books include The Gift of Science, Leibniz in the Modern Legal Tradition, and the edited collection Thinking in Dark Times, Hannah Arendt on Ethics and Politics. His talk today, he's just told me the, a slightly new title, is Revenge and the Art of Justice. And please join me in welcoming him. Um, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Jill. It's a pleasure to, to be here. So, revenge and the art of justice. Something awful has happened. Come home. Upon hearing these words on September 12, 1931, Tommy Massey rushed home from a night of partying to find his wife, Talia, badly beaten. He heard her tell how she had been dragged into a car, taken into the woods, and violently raped multiple times. Tommy, a naval soldier in the U.S. base on Pearl Harbor, called the police. But after an investigation and a trial raised questions about Talia's story and resulted in a hung jury, the five men Talia identified as her rapists were set free. It was at this point that Tommy and Talia's mother, Grace Fortescue, decided to take matters into their own hands. They kidnapped Joe Kauai, one of the men accused of the rape, and tortured him seeking to elicit a confession. In the process of a violent interrogation, they killed him. They were put on trial for murder. Mixing race, sex, and revenge in a potent brew, the Massey trial attracted national attention. It also seduced the most famous attorney of the 20th century, Clarence Darrow, to forgo his retirement and to travel to Hawaii to defend Massey, Grace, and their accomplices. Darrow's closing statement, which he later published under the title, The Unwritten Law, is perhaps the greatest legal brief arguing for the natural justice of revenge. In an oration that lasted the entire day and was broadcast live across the United States, Darrow intoned, and I quote, There is, somewhere deep in the feelings and instincts of man, a yearning for justice, an idea of what is right and wrong, of what is fair between man and man, that came before the first law was written and will abide after the last one is dead. For Darrow, the right of revenge is an unwritten law, one that has its source neither in legislation nor in custom, but in nature. In nature, that's what I want to point out. Massey's revenge, Darrow argued, was a case of what nature has done. I don't care whether it is a human mother, he wrote, a mother of beasts or birds. He talks about a she-bear at one point. They're all alike. Nature's laws demands action, even when the law of society does not. That may sound uncivilized, Darrow admits, but it is not. Rather, it is an affirmation of life. Life, he affirms, does not come from laws and rules. Life is natural. Life comes from a devotion of mothers, of husbands. Without this love, this devotion, the world will be a desolate and cold place and will take its lonely course around the sun alone. Without a human heartbeat, there will be nothing except thin air. Every instinct that moves human beings, every feeling that is with you or any of your kin, every feeling that moves in the mother of the animal is with us in this case. You can't fight against it. If you do, you are fighting against nature and life. Revenge, Darrow insisted, is an element of life, of nature. Gracie and Tommy, 
mother and husband, were thrust back upon motivations primitive and powerful. Nature, the primal urge to vengeance, may be against the law, but it is fully in accord with the law of nature. We can divide Darrow's oration and his claims into two, I think, specific claims. The first is that revenge, while it may be illegal, can nevertheless be just. The second is that the justice of revenge is situated in our human nature as animals, in basic animal instincts to preserve life and protect those whom we love. I always like to give my argument flat out at the beginning of a talk so you can follow it, and here it is. The argument today is that there is something important in Darrow's first claim that revenge can be just. Now I want to be clear, I'm not arguing that everyone should be going out and taking revenge. But I am going to suggest that revenge sometimes is just and can teach us something about justice that is often forgotten or suppressed by our civilized insistence on the injustice of revenge as opposed to the justice of legal punishment. On Darrow's second point, however, I want to demur. Against Darrow, I'm going to argue that the justice of revenge is not found in nature, in our natural animality, in our valuation of life, in nearness to beasts and birds. Instead, I want to think with you today about what I call the art of revenge, or the art of justice. If revenge is sometimes just, if revenge teaches us something about justice, it is, I argue, not because it responds to a natural urge, but because revenge is, when done well, beautiful. It is the beauty of revenge, more than its natural necessity, that elevates an act of vengeance into the doing of justice. So, to, to raise some questions about Darrow's, Darrow's reduction of revenge to nature, I want to turn uh, to a small part of a longer chapter I've written which discusses Peter Sloterdijk's reading of the Iliad. I don't know how many of you know Peter Sloterdijk, a German theorist, um, but uh, he has a great book called Zorn und Zeit, which uh, is, is worthwhile. For Peter Sloterdijk, the Iliad is a poem of human rage, wrath, Zorn. The famous opening lines of the song announce its theme, rage. Sing, goddess, the rage of Peleus' son Achilles and its devastation. Rage, Sloterdijk argues, has a double sense in Homer's poem. First, rage is a power of nature. Unreasonable and shrouded by boiling emotions, Achilles' rage wrecks havoc on Greek and Trojan alike, leading thousands of both Greek and Trojan heroes to be hurled in their multitude to the house of Hades, and leaving these strong souls of heroes to be the delicate feasting of dogs and birds. Second, rage is also a power of human freedom. Achilles' rage is a power that inspires an obstructive force within him that he rises up as a hero in response to. Rage for Sloterdijk is a power of nature, but it is a natural power that frees man from his nature, from his natural and vegetative state, and makes him a man. Rage, in other words, is the Homeric embodiment of the struggle of human nature against mere nature, and of man's at least potentially heroic victory. Only in rage does man gather into himself the strength to solve his mortal nature with an aura of greatness. The conflict between man and nature is ancient. Against the fury of nature epitomized by the flood, the biblical Nimrod proclaims the power of man to build his world. Abraham too, in Hegel's telling, quote, spurned the entirety of the relationships in which he had hitherto lived with men and nature, these beautiful relationships of his youth. Leaving his home in Chaldea, to wander the plains of Mesopotamia, Abraham snaps the bonds to his natural existence and announces the moral law that stands against and over nature. Man's response to the onslaught of nature was that nature had to be mastered. If Nimrod chooses one path to mastery, 
the Tower of Babel. Abraham chooses another, the institution of the city of law, the Jewish city. For Sloterdijk, as for Hegel, the heroic founder of laws and peoples is a man who resists and masters the force of nature. What Sloterdijk adds to the Hegelian account is the insight that it is rage, the passionate, excessive, and insatiable rage that wells up in the breast of some men that is, that is an essential aspect of human life that allows man to emerge victorious over the dominance of the lifeless world of nature. The suddenness of Achilles' explosion of wrath, however, is a sign that his rage is more than a mere force of nature. The strength and purity of Achilles' rage is a testament, and this is Sloterdijk's argument, and I think he's right, to its higher and often divine origin. Achilles' rage, writes Sloterdijk, reunites the hero with his true self and dictates from then on the direction of his action without deviation. I just point you towards the, the similar way in which that's a description of also how an artist is often imagined. An artist as the conduit who takes the truth of the muse and brings it into the world. Like Napoleon, of whom Heinrich Mann writes that he was sent to the revolution like a cannonball into battle, the hero is one possessed. The hero has no inner doubt when he is driven by wrath. He becomes a worldly vessel that carries the divinely inspired wrath of the gods. Indeed, the hero is precisely the one who can contain a superhuman wrath, thus forming a bond that brings the hero's self into harmony with a higher truth. As insightful as Sloterdijk's meditation on the central place of rage in human history is, rage is neither, I think, the key that opens the door of human freedom nor the highest theme of the Iliad. Heroes are not simply those who are enraged. Their rage must also seem to be just. Rage alone lacks a connection with justice. And here the hero is one whose extraordinary capacity for, for profound feelings is not only enraged, but is guided by an uncompromising demand for justice. Thus, I want to say that more than rage, the hero needs to be filled with the will to risk everything to right what is wrong. As an enraged angel of justice, the hero is, more often than not, an avenger. It is the passionate and driving force of vengeance that lends to rage the ennobling patina of justice that fires the Iliad's poetic core. And it's helpful to remember that the Iliad is a poem suffused with avengers. Not only Achilles, but also Chryses, the priest of Apollo, who calls forth divine vengeance on the Achaeans. Um, and of course, the revenge story that gets the whole thing um, rolling. Remember the story of Paris's judgment. At the center of the Iliad circle of revenge are the seething, unyielding, incessant, excessive, and animalistic yearnings of the goddesses Hera and, to a lesser extent, Athena. What these goddesses want is simple and extreme. They are bent on avenging themselves on Paris and the Trojans. For what reason? The injury that spurs the goddesses to vengeance is the judgment of Paris. Paris' choice of Aphrodite over Hera and Athena, what the blind singer calls in the poem's final book, the delusion of Paris. This judgment of Aphrodite as the most beautiful lies behind the division of the gods and their interests in the outcome of the war. Athena and Hera lead, their, lead the onslaught for the Achaeans. Aphrodite, assisted by Ares and Apollo, defend the Trojans against what Apollo and Zeus clearly perceived to be the excessive blood thirstiness of Hera and Athena's ambitions. More than just hatred, Hera and Athena are driven by an insatiable desire to punish Troy and see the Trojans suffer. In Book 4, with the two armies primed for battle, Paris proposes that Helen go to the victor of a mano a mano duel between himself and Menelaus. The two armies agree to accept this resolution to the war. The Trojan and Achaean soldiers disarm and they feast together on the battlefield. The fight begins, and to no one's surprise, Menelaus makes quick work of Paris, 
who is more fair than fighter. And although Aphrodite sweeps down to save Paris's life, all sides agree that Menelaus is the victor. A truce, it seems, promises to bring the endless war to its final end. Even Zeus on Mount Olympus signals his accord. It is at this point that Hera revolts and accuses Zeus of preventing her longed-for destruction of Troy. She worries that her sweat and toil, all to bring, quote, evil to Priam and his children, will have been for naught. As David Loge liberally renders Hera's outburst in his fascinating translations, quote, I want Troy dead. Its swimming pools and cellars filled with limbs, its race rotten beneath the rubble oozing pus. Even at noon in the Dardanelles lit up, all that is left a bloodstain by the sea. Hera's bile and rage are such that Zeus is taken aback. Richard Lattimore says Zeus is deeply troubled. Robert Fagels has Zeus rising in anger. Hera's demand for destruction is insatiable. She is possessed by, quote, an incessant rage. She is so implacably determined to see Troy raised that she easily agrees to Zeus's extreme demand. She will allow Zeus to destroy the three cities Hera loves most, Argos, Sparta, and Mycenae, in return for granting her vengeful desire to raise Troy to the ground. For the ancient Greeks, such an oath as Hera swears before witnesses is typical of Avengers. Hera thus swears to take revenge on Troy, whatever the costs and whatever the consequences. Hera's rage, resembling nature at her most furious, is not incidental to the Iliad. Instead, as a few commentators have seen, Hera's vengeful hatred is the, quote, model which inspires Achilles at his most vengeful. Besides Hera, only one other character in the book is described as being possessed of, quote, an incessant rage, one that is insatiable and, unsto and unstoppable. That is Achilles. Just as Zeus wonders at Hera's incessant rage in Book 4, it is Apollo who is struck by Achilles' senseless, incessant rage in Book 22. Zeus, the lawgiver, and Apollo, the god of light, are both associated with the limits of the law. Apollo especially defends Troy against the vengeful Achaeans. He is the god who is most offended by Hera and Achilles' unlimited rage. Achilles mirrors Hera as well in his blind fury, hell-bent on killing Hector and avenging Patroclus' death. On the way, he spurns all requests for mercy or ransom, insisting on paying back Patroclus' death in an endless river of blood. Achilles' parallel to Hera too is parallel to Hera too in his descent into the bestial practice of eating human flesh. In Book 5, Zeus says Hera will not stop until she can, quote, devour Priam and Priam's sons and the Trojan armies raw. There are only two other passages in the Iliad where someone speaks of eating another raw. In the final book, 24, Hector's mother, Hecabe, rejects Priam's plan to ask Achilles to accept ransom for the return of their son corp son's corpse. Instead, Hecabe says she would rather sink her teeth into Achilles' liver and eat it raw. Achilles is the third and only other character in the Iliad who is said to desire to eat raw flesh of his enemies. Achilles threatens to eat raw Hector's flesh as the Trojan hero begs Achilles to return his body to his family. Hearing Hector's offer of bronze and gold in abundance, Achilles answers, No more entreating of me, you dog, by knees or parents. I wish only that my spirit and fury would drive me to hack your meat away and eat it raw for the things that you have done to me. So there is no one who can hold off the dogs off from your head, not if they bring here and set before me ten times and twenty times the ransom and promise more in addition. Achilles is at his most bestial in Book 22 in verses that, as Joan O'Brien shows, mimic Hera's omophagi, his eating of flesh. For Achilles, in the glow of his victory over Hector is, Hector, is bent on outrage. Going far beyond acceptable Greek practice, he pierces Hector's tendons behind his ankle and lashes the fallen hero to his chariot, dragging that head so handsome once, all tumbled low in the dust. To Achilles, Hector is a dog whose raw flesh Achilles himself lusts to carve up like steak and eat. 
Achilles boasts that there is no one who would ward off the dogs from Hector. And yet, of course, Aphrodite does so. Shrouding Hector and protecting him, Aphrodite limits and stops Achilles' rage. Hermes, dispatched by Zeus to aid Priam, ensures that no such fate will befall Hector. The effect is to distance the other gods from Achilles' savage threats, countenanced only by Hera. Achilles and Hera have, in their unswerving lust for, gen for vengeance, gone too far. And thus, one reading of the book is that they pull back at this very end and reaffirm uh, the justice of Achilles' revenge, but with limits. And that's when he gives the body back to Priam and cries tears and re becomes human again by crying again uh, in front of Priam. The Iliad's pairing of Achilles and Hera shows that Achilles skirts the boundary between superhuman hero and inhuman beast. Right? That's what I want to point out. He's on that boundary between superhuman hero and inhuman beast. Like Hera, Athena, and Hecabe, Achilles is presented as, presented as falling prey to an intense, reckless, and dangerous emotional desire for unlimited punishment, for bestial punishment. It is no accident that he is associated here with three females who for the Greeks represent this feminized natural force, this chaos that threatens the rational and male order of Greek society. Like Hera, he is consumed by a vengeful rage that seeks unlimited retribution for the evils that have befallen him. He is with Hera and Athena and Hecuba implicitly aligned with force or bios, a negation of culture that dissolves even family bonds. And yet, Achilles is also the model of the heroic warrior, semi-divine, beautiful, majestic in his skill and, ma and mastery. Achilles thus occupies in this poem an ambivalent position, embodying at once the destructive power of nature and the creative force of the hero. And so this is the model of revenge that I'm working with, right? If we think of punishment as an act that's just because it's justified, rationally justified in some way. And then we think of divine punishment, God's you know, revenge is mine, says the Lord. Divine punishment as that punishment which is just without any justification. Think of the book of Job, right? Revenge is in that liminal space between them. It's a claim by a human to do justice like God without the need for justification. It's a claim to be like God. It's a claim to do God's justice, not human justice. And in that sense, revenge is dangerous. It oversteps humanity. And it risks, when it goes bad, being beastly, monstrous. But when it works, the hero steps out onto the stage as the embodiment of justice. When it works, and we have examples of this throughout the history of Western literature, and also non-Western literature, by the way, we have the Avenger, whether it's Achilles, or Orestes, or Agamemnon, whether it's John Wayne, or Clint Eastwood, whether it's the Count of Monte Cristo, um, we have the Avenger as the epitome of justice, um, who in a sense claims to do God's work, to be the agent of providence, as the Count of Monte Cristo will claim. To have the right to be superhuman, to be exceptional, to be a hero. One of the problems, of course, is that not everyone has that right. Only those who do it well. And this is the connection with revenge and artistry that I'm trying to develop here. The point is that some acts of revenge go horribly badly. For example, Massey's revenge in Hawaii in 1931. And some acts of revenge risk going badly like Achilles but end up somehow being celebrated as heroic and just. And so what I'm interested in is asking A, what does revenge tell us about justice? What is the fact 
that at times revenge can be horribly unjust, and at other times it seems to be the epitome of justice, tell us about justice. And one answer is that the suppression of revenge in legal justice is suppressing some aspect of justice that is actually important. Namely, that justice is risky, that it's exceptional, that requires judgment, that it requires um, people who act without the falling back on rules, procedures, and regulations. And so I want to explore this with you uh, in the time I have left, about 15 minutes, I think, um, with two examples um, of, of revenge. Um, and I'm going to use two examples of revenge that I think are good examples, that largely work, because I want to make my point. I've already given you a bad one, um, Mr. Massey. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and try to, with these two examples, show you why revenge can sometimes be not only right, but it's important to keep the idea of revenge alive as an idea of justice. A boy, innocent, is nabbed from the lap of happiness and exiled to an island prison for 14 years. Isolated and deprived of any trial or explanation, he suffers. He despairs. He hurls himself against the rough stone walls of his dungeon cell. He starves himself. He yearns to die. Then one day he hears the sound of digging. Hope returns, and he digs towards the sounds, finally meeting up with his fellow prisoner, the eccentric, brilliant, cosmopolitan, and fatherly Abe Faria. Faria not only educates the boy in the way of the world, but he pieces together as well the reasons for the boy's incarceration, the newfound knowledge of those responsible for this, his imprisonment, and this ignites in the boy the dual desires to live and to avenge. Now I'm sure some of you know that the boy is Edmond Dantes, otherwise known as the Count of Monte Cristo. Um, not an accident that the M Monte Cristo um, is the mountain of Christ. Um, Edmond Dantes is throughout described with Christ-like qualities, um, godly, divine, uh, in many ways. Um, the Abbe Faria gives to Dantes not only the will to avenge, although he tells him not to take revenge, but also um, an unlimited amount of wealth. Uh, finds he, has, he had buried this treasure in his other life, and um, when he escapes finally, uh, Dantes uh, finds the treasure, um, hides it on this uninhabited island, Monte Cristo, and, uh, and becomes the wealthiest man in the world by orders of magnitude. Uh, this is all, I think, fairly well known, but he never, his entire life now is driven to one purpose, to avenge himself on the three people who he comes to see are responsible for his, the, the loss of his life, or most of his life. He doesn't want to kill them. I mean, we have to remember that. He says at one point in a conversation with a young friend, um, Epinay, um, I don't want to kill them in a duel. Revenge is not about killing, it's not about honor. It's about justice. In a duel, I give them honor in fighting a duel with me. That's not enough. I need to destroy them. They destroyed me, I need to destroy them. In return for an infinite external, eternal pain, I should return the same. I should actually give them more than is their due and give them no honor. And to this, his young friend Epinay says, that's hateful. It's also bitter and dangerous. And Monte Cristo responds, only if the avenger is poor and clumsy. The avenger, he says, must be like the heroes of the English poets. He must possess, possess, be possessed by the gift of spellbinding others. And this aspect of spellbinding is key to the way um, the, the book, the novel, Monte Cristo, uh, Count of Monte Cristo, works. Um, one of the key scenes 
uh, is on the island of Monte Cristo um, with, in his cave or lair, which he has fitted with you know, concubines and servants and all sorts of things. And he brings uh, a young man to it. And they begin smoking hashish. And this is what Monte Cristo says. Nature wrestles with this divine substance, namely hashish, because our nature is not made for joy but clings to pain. Nature must be defeated in this struggle. Reality must follow dreams, and then the dream will rule, will become the master. The dream will become life, and life become a dream. What a difference is made by this transfiguration. When you compare the sorrows of real life to the pleasures of the imaginary one, you will never want to live again, only to dream forever. Try some hashish, my friend. Try it. Um, so what is hashish doing here in, in this novel? It is standing in for and symbolizing uh, the attack on nature and the need to live in a dream, right? To, the need to live in a world of fantasy. And the dream that Monte Cristo values above all else is the dream of justice. He is his whole life going to dedicate to this dream and nothing else. Now, this raises the question, is justice a dream? Is justice a fantasy? I think the answer is clearly yes. Um, for, for Plato, justice, the idea of, justice is an idea, an eidos, an idea. For Nietzsche, certainly no Platonist in many senses, um, justice is a holy lie. Art is higher than truth because art offers lies that can seduce us to life. Without lies, without dreams, without fantasies, for Nietzsche, um, life has no purpose, has no meaning. And amidst the pains of life, as he says in the genealogy, the only thing we cannot live without is a purpose, a meaning. Um, and so, uh, for Nietzsche, the, the highest form of humanity is to be an artist. He has an artist metaphysics, an artist aesthetics, because it is the artist who creates the dreams and the fantasies and the lies that seduce us to life. And so, so too with Monte Cristo. Um, Monte Cristo is going to live for the idea of justice, to seek to paint justice, to be an artist of justice. And I'm not making this up. I mean, there are whole chapters in the book about the art of, you know, art of this and the art of that, the art of toxicology. Everything he does is to be done as an art. And it is to, um, in the end, do justice in such a way as to be perfect. As he says, I am going to be, uh, I'm going to be an angel of providence. Uh, he says, I am going to be a creator. I'm Monte Cristo. I'm, I'm Jesus Christ. I mean, there's a strong religious element to the book, but it doesn't have to be only understood religiously. It can be understood artistically as well in any chance sense. Um, and so, um, for Count of Monte Cristo, the claim is that to do justice is to take revenge. He doesn't go to law. He, he has enough evidence. He, he finds all the evidence. He wants that. He could go to law and have them arrested. No, he needs to do it himself. Why? Because he needs to take the risk to make justice appear and appear powerfully. And he thinks that can only be done if he confronts his, uh, his, the people who had put him in the dungeon and who did wrong to him. And so he takes the risk. Interestingly enough, for those of you who know the book, he messes up. The richest, most savvy, most carefully planned out act of revenge in the world. He takes three acts of revenge. One of them goes horribly wrong. 
and he kills a young boy who's innocent. And Monte Cristo is distraught over this because he had planned his entire life to make it the perfect act of revenge. He had dedicated, spent unbelievable amounts of money. And, um, and the question then becomes, what should he do? And so he says to his concubine slash girlfriend, I will kill myself because I've taken my revenge, but I didn't do it right. I wasn't, I wasn't an actual, I didn't actually enact justice. And she says, no, I love you. And that brings him back to life. And he then lives with it. The point is, she sees it as just. And it's seen by just by all the three people that he avenged himself against. And that recognition of his act as just, as appropriate, as beautiful, is enough. The second example, um, I want to consider is, is, um, is one offered by Hannah Arendt. And I want to, this is not going to, this may sound strange to some of you who read some Arendt, but I want to suggest that no one has done more to articulate the need to imagine justice as a risk, to imagine justice as a work of art, and even justice as an act of revenge than Hannah Arendt. And uh, I find this in her critique of the Israeli court and its judgment in Eichmann in Jerusalem. Her critique is, is, is very simple, although it's often forgotten why she critiques it. The point is the court decided according to law. She says it did not recognize the singularity of Eichmann's <clears throat> wrong. And it basically held that he aided and abetted mass killing. And she says, excuse me, but what he did was not aiding and abetting. But he didn't actually start the genocide or kill anyone, at least there was no evidence uh, for that, at least that they could prove. And she says, in the end, it was a mistake to try and fit him into legal categories. If we're honest, aiding and abetting is all we could accuse him of legally, and that doesn't cut it. And so she says at the very end of the book in the epilogue, the court should have dared to do something different, to judge beyond the law. And I think some of you probably know it, the court should have dared, she says, to say to Eichmann, you must die for no other reason than that we and all of other humanity refuse to live with you and share the earth with you. Now, how does she know? <laughs> right? Where does she get that from? Do all humanity refuse to share the earth with Eichmann? It's a shocking judgment. It's risky. It's exceptional. It's personal. And it's mo emotional. And it's illegal. It jettisons mens rea. She says we shouldn't worry about mens rea. Um, and she admits it's undeniably based, she says, on the long forgotten propositions of revenge. The question of revenge is first broached and thematized within Eichmann in Jerusalem when Arendt draws a parallel between the arrest and trial of Adolf Eichmann and the revenge and trial of a man named Shalom Schwarzbard. And that's the trial I now want to talk about. Um, Shalom Schwarzbard uh, uh, was a Ukrainian Jew and in 1927 in Paris uh, having escaped from the pogroms, he, he, goes to, uh, he goes to Paris and he finds living in Paris uh, a man named Ilan Pitlora, who was the hatman of the Ukrainian state and the head of their army, responsible for the pogroms. Aghast at this, he stalks him, <clears throat> finds out where he goes, waits outside a restaurant, and when <laughs> Pitlora comes out, says, are you Petlora? Petlora swaps at him with a cane and he sh says this is for the Jews and he shoots five bullets into his head. He stands there and waits. He waits for the police to come and when the police come he says I have killed a murderer. I have killed the head of the pogroms and he puts himself on trial. Um, at the trial the evidence was given on both sides, but Schwarzbard never denied that he did it. He bragged about it and said, I would do it again. 
The French jury convened for 35 minutes and said he was not guilty. Now, Arendt lauds Schwarzbard's vengeance and notes that the advantages of this solution to the problem of legalities that stand in the way of justice are obvious. A trial, Arendt argues, needs a hero. And Eichmann was anything but a hero. But Schwarzbahn was a hero. And as a hero, he focused the question on the justice of his acts. Was it just, in other words, to kill the leaders of the pogrom? The trial in Paris was a show trial. Not as it was used by Stalin, but a show trial because, because in Stalin's case, the, trials were, the, the outcome was never in doubt. But Schwarzbahn's trial was a show trial. He put himself at the mercy of a jury who must judge the thin line separating law from justice by assuming the risk of death in the hope that the trial will confirm the justice of his acts. Schwarzbard is a hero and the trial character of the proceedings is safeguarded, our rent writes, because it is not a spectacle with prearranged results but contains that element of irreducible risk which is an indispensable factor in all criminal trials. What the law ignores is that riskiness. Whereas justice puts that riskiness front and center. That both Schwar that Schwarzbard was vindicated by a jury suggests that whether or not the Avenger was justified in his action, punishing his act of justice would be unjust, Arendt says. As show trials, the trial of Schwarzbard shows that the doing shows the doing of an act of justice. Schwarzbard hoped that the blood of the assassin Pelora will quote awaken the dormant universe from its somnolence and remind it of the savage crimes committed recently and again in our day against the poor and abandoned Jewish people. His act, as he wrote to his relatives in Odessa, was a clarion call to the world. Make it known, he wrote in all the cities of the Jewish world and in many other cities and towns where people have spilled the blood of Jews and outraged their most sacred things, make it known that the angry Jew has gotten his revenge. Schwarzbard's claim of vengeance speaks the language of obligation as well as anger. He writes, my forebears were drummed into oh, and, and yeah, my forebears were drummed into my head from my earliest childhood. I'm sorry, that's not him. That's a man named Milos von Gilas, who's a Montenegrin leader, explaining the obligation he has to take revenge. My forebears were drummed into my head from my earliest childhood. In that long line, I am but a link, inserted only that I might form another to preserve the continuity of the family, the people, and the human race. Otherwise, the earth would be an unpeopled desert with none to tell of it. Man achieves permanence only through those whom he has made to live after him. That's Gilas. What redeems an ignominious death is only the hope that one will be noticed, that someone will take notice of one's passing. This is why the justice of revenge is often imagined as a tie and an obligation to one's people or one's ancestors. Revenge, according to the original sense of its proto-Indo-European -Indo root, is a way of taking notice. Acts of revenge can, when they result in showing of justice being done, thus take notice and engender a common sense that binds a people together into a politics. The bond between politics, justice, and revenge is also what underlies the oft-cited maxim that justice must not, must not only be done, but must, 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 uh, but must seen, be seen to be done. Justice must not only be done, but must be seen to be done. Arendt cites this maxim just two sentences before she offers her own version of the judgment that reveals how the justice of what was done in Jerusalem would have emerged to be seen by all, namely in her judgment. In agreement with the trial's outcome, Eichmann's capital punishment, Arendt's truck with the decision by the Israeli court is that it did not show justice. Justice as the goddess decay, in her glorious regalia. Because the judges did not own up honestly to the unprecedented nature of the trial, or of Eichmann himself as a wrongdoer, the trial failed in its core capacity to show justice. And so here's my last concluding paragraph for today. The criteria by which action is judged is greatness. This is Arendt. For only extraordinary and beautiful acts can inaugurate something new. 
As Arendt recognizes, revenge is one such act that, when done properly, can respond to the unprecedented in such a way that it can inaugurate a new legal consciousness founded upon a new common world. There is a beauty to a well-wrought act of revenge, the symmetry of an eye for an eye and a life for a life, and the glorious heroism of the avenger who risks himself for the doing of justice. Beauty is not an adornment of an act of judging. Judgment needs beauty, for without beauty, judgment is fleeting and has no ability to change the world. That is why acting and speaking men need the help of homo faber, mainly working men, artists, in their highest capacity. That is the help of the artists, of poets and historiographers, of monument builders or writers, because without them, the only product of their activity, the story they enact and tell, would not survive at all. And what I'm trying to suggest today is what we also need are avengers at times. So, thank you. Take some questions? No. <laughs> yes. Do you want me to call on people? Um, yeah. However you want to do it. Yeah. Um, so, please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I, one thing I take you to be saying is that uh, revenge reveals something significant about justice. Maybe it reveals a couple significant things. Mm -hmm. One of which is the risk that's involved. Risk is involved with revenge. Revenge is sometimes in accordance with justice, and that reveals that justice in, involves this irreducible risk. Yeah. Um, but it seems like across the good case and the bad case, where revenge is just and revenge is not just, we have risk. Yep. Um, and so I was wondering if maybe you could spell out a little bit more for me what, what exactly distinguishes the two cases. Because it kind of seems to me like right now, what distinguishes them is one is in accord with justice and one isn't. Yep. And so then it seems like, well, well, then how is this really revelatory of risk? Uh -huh. So, yeah. What distinguishes a Picasso from the pole in the middle of the room? Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, a silly question, except you know a Picasso is a work of art, right. and you know that's not. Um, you know that what the Count of Monte Cristo did was just. You know what Shalom Schwarzbard did, or you may not, I don't know, but the jury in France did, that it was just. Did Shalom Schwarzbard know that the jury was going to tell him it was just? Not at all. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, the jury in Hawaii knew that Massey was not just, which is why they found him guilty again, even despite Darrow's beautiful oration. Right? Um, and so, if you're asking me for criteria to determine when, a, uh, when an act think it's just because it's just, or is it just because other people think it's just? Do you understand? Yeah. Um, and uh, we can ask the same thing about Picasso. Is it art because other people say it's art, or do they say it's art because it's art? Um, um, uh, a man named Martin Heidegger wrote an essay on this called The Arge and the Work of Art, where he said that all attempts to find the arge and the work of art in either the work or in the artist are circular, because what makes an artist an artist? Well, that he makes art. What makes the art? That an artist made it. And, you know, at some point you get caught in this circle. Um, the same could be said about revenge. Uh, so, I, I, I'm not trying to argue that the jury is the criteria, because the jury could ostensibly get it wrong, A, and B, um, if they get it right, uh, they could be getting it right because it's, it was just. So the criteria, um, what I'm trying to, what I would like to suggest is, uh, is that um, a well-wrought act of revenge, like a well-wrought work of art, will silence all questions. Okay? In the sense that, you know, there are some pieces of art where we, we have disagreements, but there are many where we don't, right? Uh, and I would say the same thing about an act of revenge. There are ways in which 
acts of revenge can be done in which there's almost nobody I could imagine would say that's unjust. And if they do, I would say that most of us would rightly say they're wrong. Um, I, okay, yeah. uh, I was thinking of, of examples. Uh, Gandhi said, an eye for an eye will make the world go blind. Yeah. And uh, then I'm thinking, stretching the meaning of uh, revenge in terms of, of he stole out of the train and treated in a discriminatory way, and he goes into this protest of nonviolence, confrontation, as a way of making a deep shift. It's out of the law. Mm -hmm. When we think of the Boston Tea Party, any time of conscientious objection, stretching the law beyond the law, it may not be a, a, a tit for tat, so to speak, an eye for an eye. But I'm just wondering whether you have any thoughts about the parameters of so called revenge in that good sense, you know, that can be risky, courageous, heroic, or seem to be just, even though it's beyond the law. And yet it's not the classic sense of, you know, you, you beat me up, I beat you up, yeah. kind of thing. What do you think about it? A lot. <laughs> it's a lot in there. Um, so let me answer it in two parts. Uh, the first, I'll just take the eye for an eye, and the, an eye for an eye, and tooth for tooth, and the whole world is toothless and blind. Uh, there's, there's always a... But it, not dead. Well, it's life for a life, yeah. Only an eye for um, right? You know, there, there's a in my family. In my family, at least, there's a there's a there's a debate about origins of that because um, Tebya says that in Fiddler in the Roof as well, and my father-in-law wrote that, and so he thinks Gandhi took it from him. But um, but let's not get into that. Uh, um, there are different ways of understanding revenge, obviously. And one of the great thinkers of revenge is Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, and so in different parts of his work, he understands revenge differently. Uh, so in a section in Zarathustra on, on, on the tarantula, he defines revenge as based in the will to equality. Eye for an eye, right? You can see the equality. Uh, in the old use talionis, the, the law, you know, like for like. and. Um, what Nietzsche says is that insofar as one seeks equality, one seeks to uh, drive all difference from the world, and, and uh, an eye for an eye, one person takes it, one person takes it, one person takes it, and there's no end to it because there's no one with the authority to establish their revenge as just, right? Um, and so as a will to equality, uh, tit for tat, uh, revenge, is never going to be beautiful or powerful. It's going to simply be leading to the next. It's a cycle of violence. But there's another idea of, of revenge, Nietzsche calls, which can only be practiced by those who feel themselves superior or difference. Um, and when revenge is practiced in that way, and he calls this, the quintessential example of this is gratitude. Right? If you, if you, um, if you take, if you kill my mother, right? And I come up to you and say, thank you, right? I destroy you, according to Nietzsche, right? Because your ability to, to show your power over me has just been shown, I've, I've completely decimated your self-worth. Um, and so Nietzsche says, the best revenge, the only good revenge is gratitude because it utterly humiliates the person uh, and thus shows your superiority over them. Um, this turns us to Gandhi, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, and let me say, and, and I know Linda Meyer spoke here uh, a couple months ago, um, and Linda is also a, a friend, and, and a lot of our, we, we talk a lot about our work, and when I started this project many years ago, it was informed by a reading of Linda's early work on, on mercy and forgiveness. Um, and what I've always told her and those who ask is, I could have easily written this work on mercy and forgiveness. To me, mercy and revenge play a similar role. They're both non-legal, sublime, singular, risky acts that attempt to do justice outside the law. 
I say, I'm just more interested in revenge than I am in mercy. <laughs> I mean, it's, and that's true. But I actually think um, Gandhi's nonviolence, you know, is something that plays a similar role in his attempt to do justice against the law than what I'm trying to say revenge can do and what Linda Meyer is trying to say mercy can do. Yeah. I'm interested in the issue of facticity and revenge. That is the Massey case, it's a famous case in Hawaiian history because it's a famous instance of American racism and Pearl yeah. Harbor was yeah, yeah. the ultimate revenge for that. That is, it, that oh, is well, Massey okay. had no case. <laughs> You know, the person he tortured to death was innocent, and it was her lover. You know, there was this recent book about the whole mess. Yeah. And Clarence Darrow was, actually knew it, and, and, and was grandstanding. So we know in that case, there was just no case. It was an act of vigilante justice in order to, never mind. Yeah, in we agree on, we, I mean, we largely agree, we agree on the Massey on case. I mean, I, it's really, I think it's an it's interesting speech that Darrow gives. I mean, the case itself yeah, but, is something else. But the facts of the case were utterly irrelevant. To the, there was no re revenge to be taken, and the person to whom there should have been revenge taken okay. wasn't, wasn't being. I understand the point, yeah. In the case of Petlura, too, um, he was not himself as the head of the of the Ukrainian mm, responsible for pogroms, and he, revenge had already been taken on him too. He, that's why he was in Paris, because the Soviet Ukraine had sent him in exile, and all sorts of terrible things had happened to him. So, in that case, it, it was an in a, that's not the one that you blame for pogroms, right? I, mean, I, I can, I, I know, could, is, you know, we could have a factual argument so on the Petlura. I accept your point on the Massey case, yeah. on the Petlura case, I'm less... The Pet Petlura uh, case, so there are many other... And yeah. I don't think it so matters. Question, uh, so the facticity... So that's Facts the don't matter. You don't have to be right when you're taking no. revenge. The Count of Monte Cristo was wrong. Yeah. I mean, he got the wrong well, kid, right? Well, he was right about the three other people. But let me, but let me, let let me make your case as well as I can. And, the, um, deal with that. Yeah, no, I mean, I, the first essay I ever wrote on, on this topic uh, in, an, in, a, in, a, in a journal, a special issue of a journal I, I edited, uh, was on Clint Eastwood's Mystic River. All right, yeah. Do you know the movie? Yeah. Um, so... You know, here's a case in which uh, the main character, uh, his daughter is killed, and you know his daughter, who he absolutely adores, you know, blah blah blah, and um, he is livid, and um, he, in the end, takes revenge upon uh, his old friend of his, who he thinks murdered him, Davy, and he gets it wrong. Um, and what I love about Mystic River, I wrote, you know, this is that. Usually, Hollywood makes it easy on itself, right? The gay always get the right guy. But here, Clint Eastwood films a movie in which they get the wrong guy. And yet, at the end of the movie, um, you know, uh, Jimmy, the, the main character, you see him, he realizes he's gotten the wrong guy, and his wife, I think Laura Linney, uh, you know, comes up to him. He's, he's shirtless, got this big sword of Christ on the back of him and his wife starts fondling him and seducing him and um, bringing him to orgasm and as she does it she says you're a king you're a master and we know that you will always look out for us and take care of us and we love you for that and she basically says to him even if you got the wrong guy we love you. Sort of like what Count of Monte Cristo's concubine does. And then, at the end of the movie, he sits out there on a stoop as the parade goes by with all of his people around him, with the sunglasses on, looking like the king. And so, um, what is it about the guy who gets it wrong that allows Eastwood still at least arguably, and I, I co-wrote the piece and we had a disagreement on this, but it was interesting. Arguably to say, okay, he got the wrong guy, but he was acting justly. Because he had a gorgeous tattoo. <laughs> well, I, wanted, I, I was trying to make a slightly different argument, um, which, which, is that, which is that Jimmy, the, the main character who takes the revenge, was someone who was the leader of his 
Vlach and his people, and that in a certain sense, this leader figure, this actor, this strong figure, has a responsibility to act. And if he gets it wrong, it's a tragedy, but it's not unjust. It's actually not wrong for him to take that chance and take that risk. Now, I think that's Eastwood's account. Now, not to say, you know, you can then disagree with it, but what I'm saying is there's a strong argument to be made that even when the facts aren't there, there are certain people who have that something that makes what they do right. Now, that's part of the hard nut of this argument that I'm making to, to take, because what I'm basically saying is, to a world in which we all believe that everyone should be treated equally, that some people have the right to take revenge and some people don't. And the only thing that makes you know whether they're the person who has that right is that they do it well. That they're an artist. Just like some people have the right to be artists and some don't. And that, I think, their artisticness, their artistic nature is in many ways more important than getting it right. If you're interested in the idea of justice. That's, a, I mean, that's, that's the strong claim. And I think it's the claim Eastwood makes. That's why I thought such a, a brave movie in many ways. Yeah, Christina. And that's where you're freaking me out. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I live here. This is great. I mean, one thing I really like at the beginning of this is, I mean, I think it's incredibly generative to think about revenge as art, yep. right? And to think about beyond law, but the way it's, which it's beyond law, but trying to get close to the law, um, that it has a lot to do with agency and freedom and world building and this kind of reading of the extraordinary. Yeah. But the place where, well, there's a couple places I don't go with you, but the place that strikes me is, you said when revenge is done beautifully, it silences all questions. Yeah. And I don't get why you'd want to go there, because it just strikes me that if revenge done beautifully, why can't that be still the space for contingency? Why can't that still be the space where there's an ongoing openness that leaves space for, that, that it, it remains a space in which it's constantly demanding accounting for what occurred? Like, why not leave that as a space for um, the ongoing debate about judgment? Because that silencing moment also strikes me as, in the same way that we know art when we see it, that we there, that we there seems to turn on a couple of things that are really important, like the we of the we of the we of shared gender, the we of shared race. I mean, it's not unimportant that so many of the examples of justice gone awry go awry precisely on those spaces of, of racial difference, gender difference, tribal assumptions. So I want to I, I want to understand more about the why done beautifully, why there would be something productive in the silencing of all questions. Yeah. Um, is it awe? Yes. Yeah, it's awe. <laughs> it's, it, it's Kantian, right? <laughs> it's, it's that, it's the awe that one who acts in accord with the universal law mm -hmm. um, uh, manifests in the world. And on the basis of that awe, exemplifies justice and calls others to do it. Um, on one level. Um, on another level, it's the willingness to take a risk and put oneself, uh, so the first, by the way, the act of revenge puts you on trial. I mean, that's what I'm trying to say, right? I'm, I'm not sort of, pr someone asked about private justice before and I didn't answer the question now, I remember. Um, no, I think revenge has to be public. You have to put yourself on trial somewhere. Mm -hmm. Now, the Count of Monte Cristo didn't do that, but he did in front of Haide, right? And in front of all the people he took the revenge for, he, every one of them he confronted personally, and they all recognized his justice in doing so. So at least somewhere, you have to confront someone who recognizes it. Um, uh, so, it's, so the act of revenge doesn't necessarily silence. There's a trial. Mm -hmm. uh, but the trial is then a place in which the jury can say yes or no. But I don't think it should be a bunch of people arguing about yes and no. I think they should either say yes or no, back in the old way of a jury trial. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and, and to that extent, I think that the act of revenge should either be just or unjust. So there's an island of agreement. There's a moment, there's a moment of standing. And, and you can say to me, very rightly, well, 
what about when people disagree and what who is the we mm -hmm. and what I would say to you is this if there's not silent awe awe inspired agreement then it was unjust Arendt says they should have dared to do this right who thinks Arendt's judgment was unjust that's an easy case maybe mm -hmm. right she points to Schwarzbard's case, and you know you, you you may think that you may disagree, but at you know at the trial, the Ukrainians disagreed. Yeah. Well, the Ukrainians <laughs> disagreed, um, but we weren't in Ukraine; we were in Paris. We were in Paris. Um, and, and this brings up another point: this judgment is political, but not in the sense that it's you know my politics against your politics. It's that when I take a risk and I judge, I'm asking a people to agree with me. Yeah. And when they do, we reconstitute a certain ethical bond. Mm -hmm. That's what, and that's what the act of justice does. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to suggest is that by excising acts of justice from our society through cutting off the extremes through the law, we, we lose the opportunities mm -hmm. to actually have meaningful discussions public discussions about what is just. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We only talk about what is legal. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing more important <coughs> to talk about than what is just. Mm -hmm. And then we lose the idea that you should be just even when it's inconvenient. And we get, you know, everything from the financial crisis to, you know, mm -hmm. we, we, we lose the idea that people, that there's an ideal of justice that a good person, you know, it used to be that a good lawyer or a good businessman was not just someone trying to make a buck or follow the law, but was trying to do justice or do the right by in the world. And I think we've, we need to bring back the discussion of ideals. Mm -hmm. You know, one way to understand this project, you know, I edited a book series for Fordham called Just Ideas. And the premise of it is that in liberal thought today, justice is just an idea. And we talk about power. And we talk about um, politics and it's an ideology justice and what I'm trying to say is it's time for people on the left as well as the right to remember that justice is important mm -hmm. and that we need to have the idea of justice mm -hmm. in society uh, and if we cut off judgments extreme judgments difficult judgments we lose justice that's sort of the that's the interest in the in the paper yeah, I'm just talking, it's just so interesting how it's, it's incredibly political but then there's a way in which it feels non-political at some point. That's what I'm trying to bring up, the circularity. Well, it's, it's, it's political in the sense of it's, it's an attempt to, to create, to constitute a polity yeah. um, according to, in a sense, awe. Mm -hmm. Right? Not political in the it's you know, that's the way it's, it's trying to constitute a polity. In the old sense of a polis, you know, the, you know, the polis from the verb pelein, the smoke rings that go up around in a circle, so that a polis is the the center that brings a group of plural people around it and unites them into a unity, um, that's what acts of judgment do, as far as I understand acts of judgment. Yeah? Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that out of justice, people can choose whether and how to take revenge. Also out of justice? No, out of justice. Like people can choose to whether and how to take revenge. I missed the first part of what you said. Okay, just people can choose whether and how yeah. to take revenge. And, uh, but if it's just, it, it requires recognition of whether it's just or not. And it requires like kind of bond between a group of people. Mm -hmm. So the question is, does people really have free will, free choice of taking revenge in justice, whether the person is the avenger or the victim or the, vic or the witness or the jury? And what do you think is the significance of? So, uh, let me make sure I understand your question. You're saying, does Schwarzbart have the free will whether to kill Pit Laura or not? Uh, my question is that people can choose whether and how to take revenge. Yeah. But for revenge. They can also choose not to, yeah. Yeah. But for re revenge to be justified, the, re the revenge needs recognition and needs a group of people to recognize it. Yeah. So my question is, so under this kind of circumstances, whether, so does, do people really actually have free will to take revenge and make this kind of revenge justified? 
Um, well, I think, you know, if someone kills my daughter, I have the free will to call the police or to pick up a knife and stab them 40,000 times, right? Uh, I mean, I guess someone could say, well, no, you know, adrenaline is coursing through your body and it depends what you ate and, and things like that. But, I mean, I generally think I have that choice. Um, uh, and if I did it, I, uh, it would then be up to you and you and you to say, well, should I, was I justified to do that? Was I right to do that? I'm not justified, I don't want to use right to do it. I don't think it's a question of justification. I think it's a question of justice. And this comes back to the question. I, I, once you start talking about justification, you get down a question of science and, and, and putting rules and criteria. Um, I ask you to judge me. And it may be that you judge me guilty, but it may also be that you don't. And whether you do or not, um, will tell us a lot about you as much as about me and about us. Yeah. This question comes in e e e Wong's question at a different angle, which is the concept of the animal that you've used and going back to the Greeks. And it seems to me that Pocat, the concept of the bestial is uh, the instances that you talked about is, you know, the, the, the eaten by the, uh, you're dead and being eaten by the animals. And, um, and then the cases of, you know, humans wanting to eat, as the presumption is that animals want to eat. And there is a statement of Schelling that says we do the, the animals a grave injustice by attributing to them the kind of bestiality that only we are capable Yes. Of oh, great. <laughs> so I'm really interested in how, in the beginning, you kind of derived, quote, moral outrage or rage for revenge from a kind of animal rage. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that that's justified. I mean, it's the case okay. yeah, that some primates do yeah. intra-species violence of this sort, but I'm wondering if that troubles your account, that the art, the artfulness of the human to take this animal instinct and turn it into something beautiful. That's sort of an old story, but what if the animal doesn't have that instinct? Uh, I, I actually would, would largely agree with you. Um, um, or, you know, I, I think it's a, at least an empirical question. Um, you know, I, I, I approach the animal here mm -hmm. because the animal is approached by Darrow and by the Greeks. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying to set up an opposition, right? I'm using this because I'm saying, look, I'm not the only person in the world who's ever justified revenge or talking about the justice of revenge, but most people who do talk about the unwritten law, the law of nature, etc. And I'm trying to actually say that's not my project. My project is to talk about revenge as an art. Um, uh, I'm thus, so, he, so here's where I, I am, I am trying to say that um, to reject the possibility of extraordinary acts is to dehumanize man, kind. Um, man, and, and, and we could then, some people, you know, I could then say turn him into an animal, but you could rightly say, well, animals are not just inhuman humans. Uh, and I'd say, you're right. So I don't need to call him. I, I'm simply using this, this, this uh, opposition. Uh, you know, I do, in other things that I've written, right, address this question of the animal quite, I've written a, a bit on this, and um, largely not from the side that most people today are writing, right? I'm, I'm sort of criticizing, you know, the Nietzsche Derrida line and along, the, and I'm coming from the Heideggerian Arendt line, which is to say that it's important to not reduce man to his animality, as someone like Nietzsche or Derrida would, would want to, to try to do today. Um, and, uh, and the essence of humanity, as I think Arendt and Heidegger both understand it, is um, the openness of man to, in Arendt's words, 
um, spontaneity and freedom, and to the givenness of, of life, and into Heidegger's, in Heidegger's language, it's to the um, standing in the open of being. Um, those two qualities of being human, um, I think are absolutely essential. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to say we need to preserve them and nurture them. And more and more as we um, try and cut out the extremes of life and trade justice for order or, um, and safety, uh, we, we cut out those extremes of freedom and of the relation to being, however you want to put it, uh, in which we most are human. And, and that's very much where this project comes out of. Um, but I, I have, I've also written very much on the humanity of some animals, right? I mean, elephants and fascinating studies of elephants who can mourn and whatever. And yet, even though elephants can mourn and can revenge, actually elephants do take revenge. It's a fascinating um, aspect of it. Uh, I don't think that elephants in their revenge um, are actualizing an idea of justice. Now, I could be wrong. I'm not going to go to the bat, you know, mat on that one. I just don't think they are. I don't know if that helps. Yeah. Um, so Hannah Arendt also emphasized in Eichmann, um, the Rüste, like Eichmann in Jerusalem, he, um, that Eichmann has kind of lost the ability to think. Yeah. And she also very much emphasized that he has this empathy. So and I would argue that she sees that also as the essence of humanity. So to think. Yes. Yeah. No, I think that's... Independently on your own, yeah. without prescriptive discourse, and also to have empathy for other human beings. So would an act of revenge not be a moment where you... Isn't that a moment where you stop thinking? Yeah. Um, well, I, I certainly think you're absolutely right about the first part, that to be human for her is to think, which, is, which she takes right from Heidegger um, on his essay, Was heißt Denken? What is called thinking? What is called thinking? And elsewhere, uh, which is not a critique. I mean, I think she, she really, she and he agree on that. I, you'd have to show me where she says that um, humanity is equated with empathy. Um, certainly pity is not something she values. Um, I, I, Meaning empathy, which is what was kind of her... She um, does talk about thinking in the shoes of another, if that's what you mean. In the first place, because she thought that for her, it should she should be able to empathize with Eichmann, even though he was the perpetrator. That she should try to understand... Well, there's a difference between <coughs> empathize, which is thinking, feeling what one feels, and thinking I mean in the, the shoes of another. What? I mean the German word nachvollziehen. Nachvollziehen. Yes. So thinking through what somebody else may have been thinking. Yeah. Right, but that's different from empathy. Yes, but there's an empathy. Empath 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 okay. Aspect. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think that what Arendt understands as distinguishing man from animal is the ability to think, uh, not empath. I I, I want to resist empathy, but to think and to includes thinking in the shoes of or in the place of another, uh, which is not feeling in the place of another. Um, uh, and, um, but it also includes stopping and, uh, and, and thinking what is actually going on here. Um, and, and she certainly does say that that's what Eichmann could not do. He was caught up in cliches and common sense tr truisms that he could not escape. Um, what I'm trying to suggest is that one thing revenge does is it makes us stop and think. Right? You don't have to think when someone commits a crime and you put them on trial and you ask whether they uh, violated the law. What do people then do who have to judge that person? So they have to think. Yeah, but the person who, uh, who acts, like who commits the act of revenge, the avenger, 
You don't think they think? Well, I mean, do you think Picasso thinks when he, when he paints a painting? Right? Some people would say Picasso doesn't. He just, you know, goes and does this and there's no thought involved. Right? But there is, you know, again, I, as far as I understand, I mean, one of the things I've been doing for this project is reading a lot of artists and what they write. An artist is an attempt to, in a sense, give themselves over to some truth that they try and express. There are some, look, there are some bad Avengers. Um, excuse me. There are some Avengers who um, can't, uh, who don't think and just respond uh, in some visceral way. Um, but there are some who uh, are very much actualizing what they think is the right thing to do. And I think that's what's at issue. Um, So you saw him Schwarzbard, you don't think thought. In that moment? Maybe, I mean, that, that's, another, that, 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 that's another question, though. But that, that is that, the question. That would then bring us to... The singular the case. Issue, I think. Yes, because then, you, then there's actually the aspect of planning. The, yeah. The and, I, and I'm saying that each case has to be thought individually. Mm -hmm. um, that's all I'm asking. So I stood up because of the window. But so I think we have time for one more question, if there is. There's one over here, yeah. Is there another one, or no? Um, I just have a quick question. Um, you talk about how the law and kind of fear of unjust acts has cut out these extreme acts, right? Okay. So I'm interested in what is then, based on this conception of justice, the relationship between law and justice. Do you want us to reconceptualize the law and modify it in order to include? Because this is right now, this is justice that is beyond the law. Um, and whether we should yeah. include it within our thinking of law or keep it beyond the law, but how would it relate then to the law? Yeah. Like in Clint Eastwood example. It's not a quick question. <laughs> um, but it's a good one, and it's a good one maybe to end with. Um, you know, my. Uh, As Jill said at the very beginning, I, I write about justice. That's what I, you know, that's my background. Um, and uh, one of the things that I've spent most of my time writing about is um, why the separation of law from justice has become so clear, right? Uh, it used to be that justice was justice and law was simply an expression of justice. And, we had uh, judges who would try, uh, you know, a jury in the old days didn't have rules or didn't, you know, wasn't just about giving facts. You would go before a jury, you'd say what happened and they would issue a judgment. A just judgment. That was also a legal judgment. Um, as the jury has become regulated and rule bound and everything else, the jurors now are supposed to simply say whether the person is guilty or not based on the laws and the facts application to the laws. Um, now, they have this other power called jury nullification, which lawyers hate, but I think is actually the last bastion of justice in the law. But, um, and so uh, I'm, I, I think what, you'll see, what you've seen here is that this is an attempt to vitalize that last bastion of justice in the law, namely jury nullification. That's in a way what the project is, is about. Um, overall, though, this is a response to my first book, right? I wrote a book called The Gift of Science. And the argument of that book, in a nutshell, is that the meaning of justice in our time has changed. And that whereas justice once was based on judgment and insight, it is now based on objective criteria and science. And the reason is, is that in order to base a judgment on insight, or judgment, you have to have authority. And nobody has authority today. This is part of the crisis of authority, the death of God, the rise of the Enlightenment. I, my judgment is as good as your judgment. And since nobody trusts another to judge right and wrong, we set right and wrong into rules and into objective scientific criteria, whether it's utilitarianism, or deterrence, or law and economics, or you know, how whatever different theory of, 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 of scientific justice 
uh, one wants to put forward, and my book traces it you know, from the 17th century to the present. Um, and so Hannah Arendt says in, in her book On Revolution, talking about the American Constitution, something very similar, which is the Constitution used to be a place in which the idea of justice was there, and the judges said it's constitutional, that's unconstitutional. Look at a constitutional court case now. It's all about treating the Constitution not as an idea of justice or an idea of what unifies us as a people, but as a bunch of super rules. They're not, right, they're just more rules. And so the court is just now a super legislature. And the problem we have is that when the court becomes a super legislature, and it's just applying rules, not saying what justice is, people lose faith in the court because why should we trust nine people instead of 535 people? And so you have people like Jeremy Waldron, who I think is one of the most consistent thinkers in the legal realm, saying judicial review should be abolished. Why? Because it's just, the court is just another democratic body at this point. We've lost the idea of the Supreme Court as telling us what is constitutional as an idea of justice, and it's just now another legal regime. And so he says, if that's the case, I'd rather have the democracy of the Congress than the democracy of nine people who I'm, are not accountable to anybody. And that's actually Arendt's point as well in On Revolution, the, which he calls the lost treasure of the American Revolution and the lost ability of the, the lost power of the Constitution is precisely the moment that the Constitution becomes something whose decisions have to be justified. And that, she says, is the end of the constitutional tradition in the United States. Um, the, the, danger, the, 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 the danger that I'm confronting in my work is that because we simply don't trust people to make judgments, we um, refuse judgment on any other criteria except rules. And um, and that uh, has led to the evacuation of justice from, from our common discourse, our public discourse. That's the, that's the <coughs> argument. And perhaps we end with that. Okay. Right. Thank you.